what we are going to discuss are handgun bullets and their effectiveness. Which bullet types and calibers are effective and which are not effective, and most importantly, why? But first we must have a clear answer to a crucial question. What is the purpose of a bullet? Now before we can define that purpose, we must understand the context in which this definition is made. Our context here is not one of target shooting, cartridge collecting, or even hunting. It is the use of firearms against human beings. To be more specific, it is the use of bullets by law enforcement, military, or law-abiding private citizens in self-defense or in the defense of others. Now with that context made clear, we can define the true purpose of a bullet. A bullet's function is to incapacitate a person. In the technical sense, to incapacitate someone is to disable him, to prevent him from acting out his will. In real life, the most common and crucial situation requiring incapacitation is one in which you are trying to prevent a criminal from utilizing a firearm or, or other deadly weapon to injure someone. And in such a situation, the incapacitation of a bad guy must be as close to instantaneous as possible, as it only takes a fraction of a second for a trigger to be pulled. As most of you are aware, the fact is that the only way to quickly and effectively incapacitate a person is to kill him with a bullet. Now that may sound primitive and, and savage, but the truth is there are many situations in which there is no other method. Yes, you've all heard about, about tranquilizer darts, nets, electric stun guns, tasers, and tear gas, and so on. And while there are situations in which such non-lethal devices can be practically used, there are too many situations, and I'm sure you can all think of several, in which a bullet is the only option. Now that we're talking about bullets, let's discuss the myth of shooting to wound as opposed to shooting to kill. Attempting to shoot someone with the intention of only wounding him is a very difficult and risky feat. You may, you may miss what you're aiming at, and you may hit a vital spot, and you may, or you may inflict a wound which will prove to be fatal later on in spite of medical intervention. The real problem with shooting to wound is that doing so will not likely cause the individual to immediately stop whatever it is that he is doing or threatening to do. And if the bad guy is not doing or about to do something which requires immediate incapacitation, then why should anyone be shooting at him? The point is, if someone warrants being shot, the purpose should be to immediately incapacitate him. And if there are any of you out there who wonder, as did a reporter I once spoke to when I was a police officer, why we can't just shoot the gun out of the bad guy's hand instead of shooting him. Well, all I can say is that you watch too much TV and you need more basic familiarization with firearms than I can provide here. Now, if anyone has any doubts about the need, the legitimate need, for a bullet which can cause sudden or instant incapacitation, then listen carefully to the details of the famous 1986 Miami FBI shootout. The FBI was after two men who had been committing numerous violent armored car and bank robberies, as well as several homicides. These two criminals were known to be well-armed and to be likely to use their weapons to resist arrest. The FBI agents, through good basic police work, were able to spot the two bad guys driving a stolen vehicle, the owner of which they'd shot and left for dead. With a total of eight FBI agents and five cars, they forced the bad guy's vehicle to stop in an attempt to make the arrest. The two criminals were not intimidated by the numbers against them. They immediately opened fire. A long, intense gun battle resulted between the FBI agents and the two bad guys, the full story of which is truly gripping and dramatic. But the key point is this. Very early in the battle, right in the beginning, one of the bad guys was hit with a 9mm silver tip hollow point. The bullet entered his chest through his arm, into his chest this way, and causing a, what the coroner later called a non-survivable wound. This means the wound he received was such that had he been taken immediately to a hospital, he still would have died, eventually. But the fact is that after being shot, he was able to run for cover, fire back, make a firing assault on two agents behind a car some 40 feet away, get into an FBI car, start the engine, get back out of the car, run to another agent, fire at him point blank, get back in the car, and try to drive away. 
Now, he was then killed by a very brave agent who ran up right to him and put two 357 Magnum rounds into his chest and one into his head, which, which did stop him. But the important point is that after being shot the first time, this criminal was able to operate very effectively for at least four minutes, in which he fired approximately 40 rounds, killing two FBI agents and wounding four others. The truth is that had that first shot been truly effective, the bad guy would have been stopped right in the beginning and those two agents would have lived and those other agents would not have been wounded. If that bullet had been good enough to do what it was supposed to do, that man would have been stopped right in the beginning. And by the way, for those interested, a later analysis of the bad guy's blood, that number one bad guy, showed no trace of alcohol or any drugs. What he did, he did on pure, sober determination. Now that we all understand that my purpose here is to discuss situations in which firearms are needed to cause an immediate incapacitation, the question becomes one of how this can be achieved. Before we get into the physiological effects of bullets, let's examine some of the least understood and yet very important psychological effects. Now, one of the best and most knowledgeable authorities in the field of wound ballistics is Colonel Martin Fackler, MD, a military surgeon with substantial combat surgery experience and a lifelong shooter. Dr. Fackler, a board certified general surgeon, fellow of the American College of Surgeons and all that sort of stuff, is the director of the Wound Ballistic Laboratory of the U.S. Army's Military Trauma Research Division at the Letterman Army Institute of Research. Now, he has been studying gunshot wounds full-time for the last six years, and there, there are not many people in the world with his experience on the subject. Dr. Yeah, Fackler has probably done more than any other single person to correct an enormous amount of misinformation on what bullets will and won't do to the body. He's also interested in the psychological effects of being shot. So, there's a minimal difference, but what's causing these people to fall over immediately? It's, I'm, I'm sure it's the, uh, the psychogenic aspect that, oh my God, I've been shot. And I know I'm, I'm going to fall over, and maybe, maybe so I don't get shot anymore. Or maybe uh, I'm so convinced that I'm going to die when I've been shot that maybe I will. I mean, there, are instances, uh, um, there are instances in the literature where people are dead with shots that shouldn't have killed them. There's an old, uh, uh, Dr. Trunke uh, pointed one out to me in a paper he wrote called George Goodfellow, first civilian trauma surgeon. It was a doctor who was a, took care of the people in the Wild West at the OK Corral who were, who were shot. And he had an instance of, uh, it was 45 Colt they were being shot with me. Fellow who was shot through and the fellow in back of him got the same bullet in his thigh. Uh, the wound in the thigh was basically insignificant, but the fellow died. And the, the doctor remarked he, he was scared to death. And I think there is a, a real large factor here. We've grown up watching television and seeing movies where people are shot and immediately they're knocked over and they're dead. And it is so ingrained, almost like a uh, uh, hypnotic suggestion type effect, that I'm convinced there are a lot of people that just the fact that they're hit by a bullet in the torso are going to fall over. And several police uh, groups that I've lectured to have brought up, independently, brought up the same, the same thing in that they say, we notice a real big difference in the effects of our weapons on the ordinary person as opposed to the person who is high on drugs or the person who is psychotic and crazy. These persons, these persons don't, have the, don't have the brain telling them your shot fall over, and so they don't. The range of psychogenic reactions to being shot are extremely wide. There are some people who will faint upon having a firearm pointed at them. There are others who will drop instantly at the sound of a shot. And there are some who will fall to their knees and cry hysterically upon receiving the slightest of superficial wounds. Now, law enforcement experts who have studied the subject generally agree that about 40% of people who are shot will react that way. They will immediately fall down upon being shot. Now, some because they want to and some because they have to. 
But such reactions are certainly not predictable or expectable. What you should be prepared for is the opposite. Facing someone who will react aggressively to your threat and ignore his wounds when fired upon. As Dr. Fackler said, some people do fall over with minor wounds, but such reactions are psychological, not physiological. They are not reactions you can count on when your life or someone else's life is in immediate danger. Physiological reactions, in contrast, are much more predictable and reliable. For many people, and the ones that we are concerned with here, incapacitation must be the result of a physiological event, not a purely psychological one. Incapacitation of a human by gunfire usually means death. Now, in theoretical terms, it's possible to incapacitate someone without killing them. But the fact is that there are no bullets which can be depended upon to only incapacitate and, and not kill. Now, someday there may be, but there aren't now. So what we're talking about is how bullets cause death. Now, it's not a pretty subject, but one which is regrettably necessary. Let's have a look at the inside of a body. There are several critical areas which, when damaged or destroyed by a bullet, are most likely to cause sudden or rapid incapacitation. The brain is, of course, the most critical organ, but the head is a relatively small target, and the cranial vault containing the brain is even smaller. In the torso, there are three critical areas. The heart, the upper spine, and the two large blood vessels, the aorta and the vena cava, which lie deep within the body from 6 to 12 or more inches, depending upon basic body size and thickness. The most common and sensible point of aim in combat shooting is the body's center of mass, which contains the heart, upper spine, and large vessels. The question now is, what actually does a bullet do to the human body? Now, the first and most basic effect of a bullet penetrating entering a body is that it crushes the tissue it contacts. It makes a hole. This is called the permanent cavity. It also causes some stretching of tissue called the temporary cavity. And within that fact lies an enormous amount of faulty data, invalid assumptions, and erroneous conclusions. You know, what we used to call BS. Now, bullets do stretch tissue. This brief thousandths of a second event called temporary cavitation is incorrectly regarded by many experts as the most important of all bullet effects upon the body. And while this is wrong, and it always has been wrong, you really can't put too much blame upon those who believe in it, because the importance of temporary cavitation has been discovered and promoted by people whom you might assume should know what they're talking about. The United States government's Department of Justice, the Bureau of Standards, and the National Criminal Justice Council. In 1975, the Department of Justice, working with the National Bureau of Standards, and these are the same guys who are now screwing up the uh, body armor standards, but that, that's another story. Anyway, these people, along with the uh, U.S. Army Ballistics Research Lab, decided to scientifically test handgun ammunition for effectiveness. It was, we might say, a noble effort, but it was fatally flawed right from the beginning. And the data produced in that study has done more to misinform people, particularly those in law enforcement, than any other source. Let's have a look at this study. The report rated virtually all available handgun ammunition by what the authors called the Relative Incapacitation Index, or RII. Now, what could have been a good idea and a valuable data resource was made invalid and misleading by the study's conviction that the maximum temporary cavity, or MTC, is the most important measure of bullet performance. Now here we see in slow motion a block of gelatin about to be shot. Note what happens as the first bullet penetrates the gelatin. First a large cavity appears, then it collapses. This is the temporary cavity. Now let's run the tape again, but this time we'll stop right at the point where the temporary cavity is at its largest volume. Now what the RII study did was to measure that cavity and then superimpose that cavity size onto a computer man model which has every square centimeter of a typical human body classified as to its overall importance in achieving incapacitation. Now this may all seem very scientific, and it is. But here's where they went wrong. They took the cavity measurement, let's say a temporary cavity of about 10 centimeters, 
and after superimposing it upon the computer man model, they made the assumption that all the tissue inside that cavity was now destroyed. This assumption is very wrong. Dr. Facker explains. A study done, uh, the so-called LEAA study done, the, uh, the effectiveness, uh, a study done to determine effectiveness of handgun ammunition for a police use done by the Department of Justice or sponsored by the Department of Justice, started out with the theory that temporary cavitation measures the effectiveness of a handgun bullet in the body. And they don't even look at the permanent cavity. Now, the permanent cavity, the, the amount of tissue that's crushed by the bullet as it passes through tissue, this is what makes holes in blood vessels and, and bowel and, and, and various parts of the body. The temporary cavity is nothing but a stretch. If, a, if the aorta is right next to a bullet that goes through and has a sizable temporary cavity, and the aorta, therefore, would be violently pushed aside. Most unlikely that it would be hurt by this violent pushing aside. Oh, there are instances but that it, it might be hurt by being stretched, but these are extremely rare. And the, the theory behind the, uh, the, the, the idea that temporary cavity uh, uh, does so much damage is, is based, on, based on an idea that is, that is uh, just not, not sound logically. In other words, the measuring the temporary cavity by a given pistol bullet. And we have, say, a 10 centimeter temporary cavity at a given depth of 5 or 10 centimeters. Okay, now, if we take a body and divide up the body in little squares and give each square a number, like in the computer man technology, and then we superimpose this, this temporary cavity on these, and every, anything, we count up the numbers that are inside the, are enclosed in the temporary cavity. Well, now, there's a big, uh, there's a big uh, logical error right here. How can a cavity have anything in it? It doesn't. The cavity, when the cavity was there, all those little squares were pushed outside it, and they weren't in the cavity. So you can't encompass, you can't include things in a cavity. But I think the idea was that the, the material, the tissue included in the cavity, superimposed in the body, was destroyed by the cavity. Well, that was the idea, and I think you can see from the pictures I, I showed you here of the colon and the lung and the muscle that that certainly is not the case. The cavity uh, produced by the bullets that, that I, I've shown here uh, that produce uh, a damage of about that much, the cavity is that big. And certainly all that tissue around it is perfectly healthy. It's obvious. Dr. Fackler has performed numerous experiments which demonstrate the actual effect of temporary cavitation upon tissue. An excellent example is the one in which he used the new AK-74 assault rifle bullet, which will create a, a larger temporary cavity than virtually any handgun bullet. Here we have uh, photographs of the autopsy of a pig who was shot while anesthetized by four shots with the AK-74 bullet. This is a non-deforming bullet, and here in the colon we see the slit-like wound made by the bullet and the bullet laid beside the wound and the slit like wound is a little is about the same size maybe slightly larger than the bullet and in lung tissue we have similar uh, situation where the slice like uh, tract of the bullet going sideways through lung is slightly larger than the cross section of the bullet the sideways cross section and a similar picture in muscle or the muscle tissue not being quite as elastic as lung it's a little, stretched a little bit. It remain, remains a little bit stretched, a little bit larger than the bullet. But here in liver, we see a marked difference. The, a massive area of about 10 centimeters of disruption, uh, or maybe 12 centimeters of disruption, caused by the temporary cavity, because certainly this area could not be hit by that bullet. And we have here marked disruption by a, a temporary cavity and it's just what we expect because the liver is a tissue that does not tolerate stretch very well. It's a not an elastic tissue as are the other tissues. So we feel the elasticity of the tissue is something that is extremely important in determining how much effect uh, the temporary cavitation will have on, on tissue. Yes, liver is an inelastic tissue, but as Dr. Fackler has pointed out, 
Most human tissue is elastic and unlikely to be damaged by temporary cavitation caused by handgun bullets. In my opinion, the, the largest permanent cavity you can get, the more effective bullet you're going to have. Because the permanent cavity absolutely crushes and therefore destroys the tissue. Another serious and incomprehensible flaw in the Department of Justice study results from the fact that the authors believe that a deeper a bullet penetrates, the less effective it is. I know that sounds crazy, but look here. This chart shows the study's vulnerability index, and a very important factor in their overall effectiveness rating of bullets. Notice how as penetration increases, vulnerability decreases. For example, if a bullet penetrates about 5 centimeters, which is about 2 inches, it is given a value of 0 0.06 on the vulnerability scale. But if that same bullet penetrates to about 21 centimeters, or 8.4 inches, then its vulnerability goes down to less than 0 0.01, six times less effective. So according to the study, the less your bullet penetrates, the more likely it is to cause incapacitation. And the deeper your bullet penetrates, the less likely it is to cause incapacitation. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't to me. And all this is quite difficult to accept when you realize that the major vessels in a body are all deep inside. And that many people have several inches of fat which must be penetrated, not to mention the problems of angled shots which require even more penetration to be effective. Now let's have a look at one bullet which had been one of the highest rated bullets in the original RII study, the Glazer Safety Slug. Dr. Fackler is shooting a 357 Magnum Glazer Safety Slug into specially formulated ballistic gelatin which accurately replicates a bullet's performance in muscle tissue. Watch the result. Well, the safety slug created a large temporary cavity and thereby earns its high score in the RII study, notice the very shallow penetration, about 10 centimeters or 4 inches or so. What you see here is quite typical of this bullet's performance. I have here an x-ray which will further validate the test you just saw. What you're seeing is the buttock of a man who had been shot with a 357 Magnum safety slug from about 10 feet. If this criminal had been shot with a good, heavy, penetrating bullet, he very likely would have had a fractured or damaged pelvis instead of a simple, torn-up, non-critical buttock. Notice that the pellet penetration is no more than four to five inches, exactly what we'd see in the gelatin test. Not enough penetration to do significant damage in most parts of the body. Well, it depends on where you hit him. If you hit him in the heart, surely. If you hit him in the, in the brain, surely. If you hit him in the abdomen, Probably not, because the big vessels are, are probably at least 15 centimeters deep in, 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 in a f direct frontal shot. And, in, and of course, any kind of an angle will increase this depth of, penetra of uh, distance from the skin. And if the guy has his arm in front of the uh, body or something, the, the glazer safety slug won't even get into the abdomen if it, if it has to go through an arm first. Now compare the performance of one of the lowest rated bullets in the RII study, the 45 caliber 230 grain full metal jacket or ball round. Here we have a penetration of over 29 inches, certainly enough to penetrate through an arm and a body from any angle, and perhaps too much penetration, but that's something we'll discuss later. Let's take a look at a few other rounds. This is a very hot 38 caliber, 110 grain hollow point round which has been issued to the Secret Service. Note that we have a penetration of 21 centimeters or about 8.4 inches, certainly less than adequate. Now what do you think we'll get with a heavier 38 caliber hollow point bullet? 158 grains and at a lower velocity, 840 feet per second. You think the penetration will be more or less? Think about it. Let's find out. We get a penetration of 36 centimeters, about 14 and a half inches. That's an increase in penetration of some 40 percent. Now we reduce the bullet's velocity by about 25 percent and increase the weight by about 40 percent, and we still got an increase in penetration of about 40 percent. Does that tell you anything about the relationship between bullet weight and penetration and velocity? 
Well, good for you if you realize that penetration is more a function of bullet weight than velocity. Heavier bullets will penetrate further than light bullets. This is true of bullets of the same type and design. You can expect that heavy full metal jacketed or solid lead bullets will penetrate further than a lighter version of the same bullet. But you can't compare the penetration of an expanding or deforming bullet with that of a non-expanding or non-deforming bullet. Another factor in penetration is the basic aerodynamic shape of a bullet. A relatively sharply pointed bullet will penetrate further than a blunt tip bullet of the same caliber and design. While velocity is not an important factor in penetration, what about the relationship between velocity and the wounding effect? Will a higher velocity bullet create a larger wound? The, uh, the idea that velocity is invariably associated with big temporary cavities and therefore you must have a big temporary cavity in order to get a high, in order to get a big temporary in other words, you have to have a high velocity to get a big temporary cavity is, is sort of contradicted by, by the wound profile I'll, I'll show you here. This is the, the Vetterly bullet. This was the uh, typical of the bullets used in military forces back in the oh, 1850s to 1870s. This Vetterly was used by the Swiss and the, uh, and the Italian armed forces, and it was the uh, bullet used by a, a fellow named Theodore Coker, who was a rather famous surgeon did a lot of wound ballistic studies in Thun, Switzerland, and he used this, this bullet. I have a friend that has a Vetterly, and he brought that up here, and we did this study in my laboratory. And here it's a large lead bullet, and it mushrooms uh, very shortly after hitting. Now, it hits at 1,357 feet per second, which is relatively low velocity, not much faster than a 22 long rifle, but the temporary cavity it forms is about as big as that formed by the M16 or the Russian AK-74. You see, so so uh, you really don't need high velocity alone. I mean, you, you cannot separate velocity from your other variables. You can take low velocity and high mass and get a big temporary cavity too, especially with a non-aerodynamic uh, bullet, which which it forms by by its mushrooming. Interestingly. There was a, uh, historically, an interesting thing associated with this, with this bullet, an interesting story. Uh, the, the velocity increase of the M16 over the 7.62 NATO, which it replaced, was about 10%. Now, if you look at the tables, it may be 12%, but in measured velocities in our laboratory, it's about 10% increase in velocity. And the marked uh, difference in, in wounding of the two was, had been attributed to high velocity. Right? Well, interestingly, when this bullet was replaced in, by military bullets, it was about the time that uh, the copper jacketed bullet was designed. And this, uh, was the, the copper jacketed bullet was designed because you couldn't shoot a lead bullet much faster than 14, 1500 feet per second because the lead would strip off into the rifling. So a copper jacketed bullet was designed. They called it a compound bullet for a while. Okay. The velocity increase was a 50% increase. These were about 1,300 feet per second. All of a sudden, our next generation was 2,000 feet per second. So here, here we're talking about a 50% increase. And you know what the effect was? The, the, everyone was complaining about the new bullets, whether they would have sufficient, uh, sufficient knockdown power or sufficient wounding power to be an effective military weapon because they would shoot through people and do very little damage compared to these. With an increase in velocity of 50%, a marked decrease in destructive effect. The, this is the, uh, the uh, Lee Metford that was used by the Brits over in, in India, which was not effective, and therefore they, they ground a little uh, a bit of the, the tip and made it a soft tip bullet. It became the dum-dum bullet, and then it became effective. You see, because they had to do something to modify the bullet because it w had such minimal wounding effect. And this is noted by many, many of, of uh, authors in the literature of the time. A fellow named Lagarde, the, you've heard of the Thompson-Lagarde experiments. He was very famous and did a lot of work on, on military wounds also. He, in his book, uh, notes this. It's noted, everyone that looks at the subject notes this. We have a marked decrease in wounding, and we have a 50%. 50% increase in velocity, that's a lot. Of Another defective perception relating to bullet effectiveness is the concept of energy deposit in foot-pounds. 
Now these are values given bullets when the bullet weight is multiplied by the velocity. The values are then expressed in foot-pounds of energy. To give you an example, a 357 Magnum traveling at about 1,300 feet per second is supposed to have the energy potential equal to the force you would need to raise 410 pounds one foot in the air. Well, some people, even some experts, think that because a bullet has 410 pounds or whatever of energy, that being hit with that bullet will be like being hit with a 410-pound weight. It's nonsense. In reality, most of the energy in that formula is converted to heat through friction when the bullet deforms and stops. The common method used to measure a bullet's kinetic energy is to shoot a bullet through a cadaver or pig muscle carefully measuring the bullet's velocity before it enters the target and immediately after it exits the target. As the target will invariably slow down the bullet by some amount, that amount is converted to foot-pounds and considered to be the amount of energy deposited in the target. Of course, if a bullet does not penetrate through a target, if it stays inside, then the energy transfer is considered to be 100%. And conversely, if the bullet passes through the target and loses only some of its velocity, then the energy deposit will be a smaller number, like 5 to 20 percent. And such a bullet will be considered, by the energy deposit proponents, to be relatively worthless. What makes this approach seriously wrong is that it ignores the really important thing. What happened to the tissue, the organs, and the vessels inside the target? Did the worthless bullet, the one which passed right through the target and kept going, did it completely penetrate and destroy the heart and sever the aorta on its way through? Did the super-duper 100% energy deposit bullet staying inside the body only hit and deform on a hard bone or thick muscle and end up virtually on the surface? These are the important factors to consider, not the energy deposited. Now here's an example of a 100% effective kinetic energy deposit bullet. You're looking at the head x-ray of a gang member who was shot execution style at close range by a rival gang. He was shot twice. The first bullet, the 100% energy deposit one, flattened out and did not penetrate the skull. It lodged in the scalp. The victim was not knocked unconscious or even seriously injured by this bullet. He only reacted by saying, ow, which prompted the shooter to fire again, but this time into his temple, inflicting a fatal wound. Now this is the first bullet which deformed and flattened against the skull, a 100% deposit of kinetic energy. Now if this bullet, which penetrated his temple and went into his brain and killed a man, had gone through and come out the other side of his head, it'd be considered a worthless bullet. This bullet would be considered 100% effective in kinetic energy terms, and this bullet, had it penetrated all the way through, would be considered relatively worthless. As a final example of the invalidity of this theory, let me show you a projectile which has much less energy than even a 22 short, yet it is devastatingly effective in wounding. This is a broadhead arrow. It has four razor-tipped sides, which are designed to cut, to slice their way through tissue. Did you know that African elephants have been killed with just one arrow like this? Which would you rather be hit with, this high-energy bullet or this very low-energy projectile? So much for the kinetic energy deposit theory. Kinetic energy is not an important factor in bullet effectiveness. Kinetic energy doesn't destroy tissue. Bullets themselves do, just the way a sharp stick or a spear does by puncturing, crushing, or tearing mechanisms. Now, there are some other myths about wound ballistics which should be cleared up, especially the concepts of knockdown power, stopping power, and shocking power. I'm going to tell you a secret about these three terms. They don't mean anything. They are very popular terms used to describe events which do not occur. Now I know that many of you who have been around firearms for a long time will have a lot of trouble accepting this. It was hard for me too. But stopping, shocking, and knockdown power are hollow and meaningless terms. Let's start with shocking power. This usually refers to a bullet's ability to create a large temporary cavity or to create a big splash from a can of pop or a jug of water. As I have been guilty of before I amended my ways. But by now I think you understand the relative insignificance of temporary cavities and spectacular splashes. Shocking power is usually 
further used to describe a bullet's potential for creating a horribly painful wound which some believe will cause a person to faint or become paralyzed with intense, unbearable pain. Neurological shock, some call it. Well, it may sound plausible until you realize a well-known phenomena. Virtually everyone who has ever been shot and lived to tell about it, and there may be some of you out there, report that they felt no pain at the time. Now remember the FBI shootout? Well, let me read you some of the statements by the agents who were shot by a 223 bullet from less than 30 feet. One who was hit in the arm with a bone damage said that he felt a blunt impact, not a sharp pain. He continued to return fire. Another who had been shooting from behind a car said, my hand was knocked back and I looked at my hand just briefly and saw that there was a large amount of blood coming from my hand and the flesh had been knocked back and it looked like part of my knuckle had been blown away. But I didn't really feel any particular pain. I only glanced at it for a split second and I put it back down and fired the two remaining shots. Now this agent took a 223 bullet in his hand from very close range. It tore off a piece of his knuckle, but he felt no pain. Now just imagine what it would feel like to hit your knuckle with a hammer or, or close a door on your hand. The little incidents usually cause intense pain, but the big ones, the serious injuries, don't seem to cause any. Many people in other serious accidents report the same thing. No pain at the time. An hour or so later, yes, but not when it happened. If you go to a large university library, you can find the journals of a French combat surgeon, Baron Larry, who in the 1800s at times performed as many as several hundred amputations in one day without anesthetic. Now he reported that the wounded soldiers would feel no pain for about an hour after being shot and that they would not react when having their arms and legs sawed off. In my research on this subject, I found an article written by Dr. Patrick D. Wall a neurological specialist with the Cerebral Functions Group of the University College in London. Uh, Dr. Wall is one of the world's experts on pain. And in one research project, he interviewed Israeli soldiers who had had their arms or legs blown up on the battlefield. He writes, We asked about their initial reactions. The majority spoke of their initial injury as painless and used neutral terms such as bang, thump, blow, etc. to describe their first feeling and often volunteer their surprise that it did not hurt. Now a very interesting and pertinent point is further made by Dr. Wall when he concluded that in the immediate phase of severe injury, like right after someone is shot, the two highest priority behaviors are fighting and escaping. He wrote, injured men like injured animals may be more than normally aggressive. Another researcher Dr. Ronald Melzack at McGill University in Canada did a study on the relationship between pain and injury and found that many people with severe traumatic injuries reported feeling no pain. He stated that while he did not understand the mechanism, it is clear that they may have a survival value. A limit on pain after injury would prevent an organism from being overwhelmed by pain and therefore allow it to carry out adaptive behavior, such as hiding, playing possum, and so forth. A shocking power is another term you should drop from your vocabulary and ignore it when you hear or read it. Stopping power is more difficult to criticize because it is so often used to mean a wide variety of things. The term is frequently used interchangeably with shocking power, but often it refers to the perceived power of a large, heavy bullet fired from a large caliber gun like a 44 Magnum. Well, let me show you what is perhaps the largest, heaviest projectile I have ever heard of anyone receiving. This projectile weighs just under three pounds, is about two inches in diameter, 12 inches long. A man was struck by this thing from virtually point-blank range. Now, how do you use stopping power fans like this as a bullet? Wouldn't this have the ultimate in stopping power? Well, this is actually a replica of the real projectile, which was a 50 caliber bolt from a bolt action rifle. Through a freak accident, the round went off prematurely before the bolt was locked closed, and it caused the bolt to be shot backward into the groin of a shooter. 
the bolt handle was sheared off, the bolt entered the man's groin area like this and came out, went all the way through his body and came out the top of his buttock like that. It hit a truck and buried itself into dirt. Here we have perhaps the ultimate stopping power big heavy bullet. But what did it do to the man? Well, of course, it, it made a huge hole in both sides of his body and caused serious internal injuries. But the man did survive, and after a few weeks in the hospital, he has returned to his normal activities, which uh, still include shooting. But the key points in this story are that when I asked him, when I interviewed him on this, what it felt like at the time, he said, quote, I didn't really feel anything. I didn't know I'd been hit until about 10 seconds later when I knew something was wrong. And he was not knocked down and he remained fully conscious. Had the situation called for it, he told me, quote, I was fully capable of returning fire. Now, if this bullet, or whatever you want to call it, won't knock you down, won't knock you unconscious, uh, and won't cause any pain, um, what would? Any more questions about stopping power? Now, the last mythical term to discuss is knockdown power. Well, the truth about this is very simple. Bullets do not knock people down. Forget all that stuff you've heard about certain bullets hitting someone with small fingers, spinning them around and knocking them flat, or bullets which will lift a man off his feet and throw him backwards several feet or yards, depending on who's telling the story. And be sure to dismiss all the nonsense you see in the movies and on TV in scenes like this. How you gonna die? The truth here is that the total energy transmitted cannot be more than the energy received, which means that if a bullet has the force necessary to knock you down, it would also knock down the person firing the gun. Now here's, a, here's a simple demonstration. A bullet does not knock you down. Your reaction to the bullet knocks you down. We in okay? Yep. Okay. Let's try and get it right. There it is. Really didn't feel like much, much less than a punch. So there's not much to it. Uh, what happens is, just as Richard once pointed out, if you come up and stick somebody in the ass with a pin, the guy's gonna jump into the air. It's not the force of the pin, it's just your reaction to it. When you're shot, it, upset, it upsets you. It may hit your nerves, you may jump into the air. Well, we've learned a lot about what doesn't work and what isn't real, and by now you must be wondering, well, what bullets are effective and what makes them so? That's what we're gonna get into right now, but first you must understand one very important point. There is no handgun bullet which is guaranteed to stop a person with one shot, regardless of caliber, velocity, or bullet type. You can never, never assume that one shot will cause sudden incapacitation. The overall destructive power of a handgun bullet, any bullet, is too low, and the human body is just too tough and unpredictable. Now here's an example. This man was shot in the face just under his right eye with a 240 grain, 44 caliber magnum bullet. The distance from the end of the barrel to his face was no more than about 16 inches away. The muzzle blast blew out his eye. The bullet entered his face and exited behind his ear. Now, this man lived long enough to crawl to his car a half block away and try to get in it when the police arrived several minutes later. Now he did eventually die, but the point is that had he been armed, and he wasn't, he could possibly have returned fire. Dr. Vincent DeMeo, a chief medical examiner in Texas, reported an interesting case in his book on gunshot wounds of a young man who was hit in the left chest from three to four feet with a 12-gauge shotgun firing number seven and a half shot. His heart, the doctor wrote, was literally shredded, yet he was able to run some 65 feet before falling over. Now the point of these examples is to give you a very clear understanding that true instant incapacitation is a relatively rare occurrence. Don't ever count on it. Now that we've established that fact, let's examine the question of what makes a bullet effective. There are several elements, but the first and most obvious is size, and for a very simple reason. The larger a bullet, the better chance it has of hitting something important inside. Although this is a simple fact, it seems to have been lost over the years. Think of it this way. 
if you had to choose a bullet diameter from say 22, which is about a quarter inch, all the way up to 10 inches in diameter, without regard for recoil, range, practicality, etc., if you were just going to choose a size, wouldn't you choose the largest, the 10 inch? Imagine this, if you will. It's the future, and you're a spaceman facing an armed bad guy. Your laser pistol has only one shot left, but you can select the diameter of your laser beam from 22 caliber, like a quarter inch, all the way up to, say, 10 inches across. Now, would you rather burn a 22 caliber hole in your enemy or a 10 inch hole? Of course, the larger hole is better, as it is much more likely to destroy something important. Now, with conventional firearms, we don't have that much of a choice. But the rule still holds that the bigger the hole, the more damage you're going to do. So you want to use the largest diameter bullet you can. The next most important element in effective bullet design and selection is penetration. Now, a bullet cannot be effective unless it is able to penetrate deeply enough to have the potential to hit the large blood vessels which lie deep inside the body. Effective penetration must be such that a coat, button, notebook, arm, thick layers of fat, bone, or an angled shot will not prevent the bullet from achieving sufficient penetration. And penetration is directly related to what? Remember? Weight. Bullet weight. If you said velocity, rewind this tape and start over. Yes, the heavier a bullet is, the deeper it can penetrate. So now we're at the point where we want a large, heavy bullet. Once the reasons for that are understood, and I hope they are at this point, we can talk about bullet types. Now there are many. There are solid lead, round nose lead, lead hollow points, jacketed hollow points, wad cutter, full metal jackets, fragmenting, to mention a few. But all these can generally be reduced to three types. Solid, expanding, and fragmenting. The fragmenting bullets, like the safety slug, do not have sufficient penetration. They almost invariably come apart near the surface of the skin, and that leaves us with the other two groups, the solid and the expanding. And herein lies a dilemma. Solid bullets are good, but an expanding bullet would seem to be the best choice because by expanding upon contact with tissue, the bullet you started with becomes physically bigger and therefore more effective. You start with this, in one case of a good expanding bullet, and end up with this, an increase of about 80%. Expanding bullets are excellent in theory, but in practice there's often a problem they don't do what they're supposed to do. They often don't expand. There are many recorded cases in which a hollow point will expand sometimes and fail to do so in others. And there are other bullets which are known never to expand in tissue. Here you see five 38 caliber bullets taken from a body during autopsy. These were the 158 grain plus P lead hollow points fired from a two and a half inch barreled Smith & Wesson Model 66. This x-ray shows four of the bullets inside the torso, and this x-ray shows the fifth bullet in the forearm near the wrist. Some of these bullets hit bone and some did not, but what you see here is very typical of the type of deformation encountered in bullets taken from bodies. While there was some expansion, most of what you see is really deformation, not perfect symmetrical expansion like you'll get in duck seal, water, or ballistic gelatin. Now, not only is it difficult to predict the performance of any one brand and caliber of hollow point bullet, but the manufacturers often change the internal design of their bullets without notice, as well as the alloy content in different production runs, which will cause great variations in performance. And they don't bother telling you this kind of stuff. Hollow points are great when they work, but there's an additional problem inherent in their design. If you had a hollow point bullet, which expanded to many times its original diameter, its massive frontal area, if it expanded really big, if it started this, this big and expanded to this big, the hollow point, the new massive frontal area, would prevent it from penetrating very far. Now, hollow point bullet design is a very difficult art, and I don't envy those involved in it. But the, the type of bullets we have today are really not very effective. There's a lot of room for improvement in hollow point bullets. 
Now there's probably someone out there right now asking, well what about velocity? Well velocity is certainly an element in bullet effectiveness, but it, it is of only secondary importance. And let me explain. You of course need enough velocity to send a bullet to its target, and with a hollow point or other expanding bullet, you need a minimum velocity to cause the bullet to expand. But the important thing to remember is, Beyond those two requirements, any increase in velocity is really unnecessary. All you'll get is a bigger muzzle blast and increased recoil. When you think of velocity, you should think in terms of what's the lowest velocity I can use effectively, not the highest. Now I know that many of you velocity freaks out there are squirming in your seats and suffering withdrawal symptoms. But you should think about what's been presented here. And I know how you feel because I, too, was a true believer in high-velocity bullets. Whatever the velocity of a bullet was, I wanted one faster. But the facts are what the facts are, and I couldn't deny it. And you shouldn't either. So have you guessed the overall secret of bullet effectiveness yet? If you haven't, I'll tell you. What really makes a bullet effective is where it hits, what exactly the bullet destroys. I told you about the man who took that monster three-pound, two-inch diameter projectile completely through the body. Why wasn't he killed? Because the projectile did not hit anything vital. Major vessels, heart, spine, or brain. That is why. Now, I'm going to show you two very graphic examples. This man died by an accidental discharge while he was cleaning his guns. Yes, he probably thought the gun was empty. He took a bullet directly into the center of his chest and was, the investigators believe, instantly incapacitated or killed. Note the fact that he did not even uncross his legs or try to get up after being shot. The bullet he took was a target load, a 38 caliber, 148 grain wad cutter. Usually travels about 700 feet per second. In another case, a suicide, a man shot himself with a 45 caliber, 230 grain, full metal jacketed bullet directly in the chest. For those interested, you can note the tissue in the barrel and the bushing marks under the wound. He was not instantly incapacitated. After he shot himself, he stood up, used an old wall telephone with a dial to call a relative and say a few words before he collapsed and bled to death. Now, why did we have a sudden incapacitation in one case and not the other? Was it because the 38 wide cutter was much more lethal a bullet? Does the 45 ball round lack shocking power, stopping power, whatever? No, no. These cases, although similar, were not identical. In each one, the bullets did different things inside the body. And it is what exactly the bullet does inside the body that counts. Now, here's an interesting photo. This is the back of a man who had been shot 43 times with a 9mm PowerPoint bullet, none of which expanded. All the bullets penetrated completely through his body, and he continued to fire back at police until he was hit by 12-gauge rifle slugs, one of which apparently hit his spine. Now you may wonder how someone could take 43 bullets through his body and continue to stand. Were the bullets ineffective? Well, Yes, to a point, but they failed to expand. But the real reason he was not incapacitated was because the pistol shots all appeared to have missed vital organs and blood vessels. Most of the bullets went through this area of the man's body, which, is, as you can see, doesn't have any large vessels. Here in the center is the heart, the aorta, and the vena cava. Certainly he was severely injured, and perhaps he would have died later from those wounds but he was certainly not incapacitated by 43 non-critical shots. For many years, you have been taught that there is some kind of magic in bullets, some sort of shocking power voodoo, or strange forces which can only be measured with computer men and vulnerability indexes and only understood by the high priests of ballistics. It isn't so. The only thing that matters is what organ, tissue, or vessel is actually hit and destroyed by the bullet. Everything else is unimportant. The point is that a very small bullet in the right place is much better than a very large bullet in the wrong place. 
And I want to say at this point that while marksmanship is very important, you must realize that even the best shot in the world cannot guarantee to instantly incapacitate because although he may hit the target, there's no way to definitively predict the actual track of the bullet in the body. And as we've seen, any body's, any particular body's reaction to being shot. There certainly is an element of chance in, in incapacitation. For example, here is an unfortunate victim of a single 25 caliber bullet, which did cause immediate incapacitation and death when the bullet struck her heart during a robbery. This bartender turned to reach for the telephone as two armed holdup men left and they fired one shot. The solid bullet went through her upper arm, entered her chest, into her left lung, through her heart, and stopped in her right lung. Now she fell immediately upon being shot. Instant incapacitation. Now I'm not trying to tell you that wound ballistics is all chance and that you might as well just close your eyes, fire a couple of shots, and hope for the best. Not at all. But you must understand that there are factors beyond your control, and that is why your best approach is to do everything in your power to control all the variables you can control. Now, learning to shoot well and maintaining a high level of skill through practice is the first step. And the second step is to choose your equipment carefully using valid information. Now the question becomes, what caliber gun do I carry and what bullet type? Well, let's dream a bit. Let's define the ideal handgun bullet. It would be reliable in feeding and firing. It would be as large as the, in diameter as possible, accurate, cause zero recoil, heavy enough to penetrate sufficiently but not over penetrate. It would be an expanding bullet which will always expand and have a flat trajectory. When you seriously consider these elements, you will find they are interrelated, which means that changing the value of one will affect the value of another. For example, the heavier the bullet, the stronger the recoil. It's physics. Bullet design and selection is by nature a compromise. You must pick the elements which are most important first and then accept its secondary shortcomings. It's a package deal. The concept of a package deal is also true when you select a handgun. Now, the largest production bullet diameter is the 45, and it's probably best to start with a bullet like that, as the 45 is a fine gun. But there are other considerations. Is an 8 or 9 shot 45 pistol better than a 14, 15, or 16 round 9 millimeter pistol? Is a 9 millimeter or a 357 Magnum with a hollow point, which actually expands every time, better than a 45 ball, which doesn't expand? or a 45 hollow point, which is supposed to expand and doesn't. Now, for many professionals, concealability is also an issue. Which type of pistol is more controllable for a second shot is a very important consideration. And above all, which do you shoot better with? Now, these are all factors you have to consider when making your own decision. If all gunfights were close range and over in one or two shots, as some people like to believe, then you could just carry a sawed-off shotgun double barrel 12 gauge with rifled slugs and no sights. But that's not the real world. There is no one answer for everyone. But getting back to bullets, the minimum weight for an acceptable bullet, I believe, is 125 grains. Now while a bullet's performance is also dependent upon the shape and composition, a bullet below that weight is not likely to be effective, especially in penetration. Now let's have a look at, some, at the performance of some of the high velocity, about 1,300 feet per second, lightweight, 110 grain hollow point bullets used by many police departments. Here is a 357 Magnum, 110 grain Supervel hollow point taken from a body. You can see the extreme deformation and some pieces of the bullet's jacket which have separated from the bullet after hitting bone. A more effective hollow point would have deformed and still remained in one piece. Here is another 110 grain Supervel hollow point, which came apart, although the lead did mushroom nicely. Now this bullet struck a criminal in the back of the neck, damaging the spine. The bullet then lodged in the throat. The criminal lived, but is paralyzed. This bullet, a Winchester 110 grain 357 Magnum hollow point, struck a criminal in the front of the neck and lodged in the spine. It also came apart. The bullets on the left and right are test bullets of the same type which have been fired into water for comparison purposes. None of these light 110 grain hollow points penetrated beyond three or four inches.
In some cases, that was enough to incapacitate. But such shallow penetration is not sufficient to be reliable in most situations, as those light hollow points are not likely to ever penetrate even an arm, and any bone contacted will almost invariably deflect or stop the bullet. Now, here we see a heavier bullet with a different construction. A 38 special 158 grain lead hollow point with a velocity of about 890 feet per second. This bullet penetrated the sternum of an armed suspect. And as you can see, the bullet mushroomed very effectively. It then went through and destroyed the suspect's heart, causing a sudden incapacitation. The bullet penetrated through his body and fell harmlessly to the floor right behind him. The question now arises, how much penetration should a bullet have and how much is too much? Now, Dr. Fackler and other experts believe the minimum penetration for a handgun bullet should be about 35 centimeters or 14 inches. This depth allows for sufficient penetration even through an arm, a heavy coat, or bone. Now, penetration beyond 40 centimeters or 16 inches can be considered excessive, but it is very difficult to find a bullet which will only go so far and stop. Now, while Overpenetration with its danger to bystanders is something to be considered. That danger appears to have been overstated in the past somewhat. If you must choose between a round which overpenetrates and one which underpenetrates, you should definitely choose the overpenetrator because the other one will likely allow the bad guy to shoot back and kill you and perhaps others. You can be sure he won't be concerned with innocent bystanders. Here's an interesting case in which this 357 Magnum 158 grain bullet was fired by a police officer at a suspect who was shooting at him. The suspect was hiding behind a wooden door and the round completely penetrated the door and entered the man's chest. He stopped shooting. He walked back to his bedroom, laid down. Two hours later, he died in the hospital. Another question you may be wondering about, how can I test bullets for penetration in tissue? And in the case of hollow points or other new bullet types, how can I test them for general effectiveness? Well, for most people, even for most police departments, it is almost impossible. It's very difficult. You'd have to have a calibrated tissue simulant. And while we'll be showing you how to make some at the end of this tape, it is quite difficult and requires some special equipment. The truth is that most of you will get your information on the effectiveness of new and old ammunition by word of mouth or by reading about them in magazines. You know what we really need is a, is a consumer reports for handguns, a group providing trustworthy, scientifically based evaluations of ammunition on a continuing basis. You know, it's really a shame that our federal government has been spending money for 10 years on a piece of data like this. But when you read the articles or listen to recommendations from now on, you will be intellectually equipped to evaluate the evaluator. Are the recommendations based on accurate assumptions about the human body? Are they made using a scientific method and calibrated to living tissue, not duck seal, newspaper, water jugs, or secondhand war stories? These are the questions you will have to ask in order to get data which will help keep you alive. Now, perhaps the most important single thing you should get out of all this is that a handgun, any handgun, is an intrinsically inadequate, underpowered, and marginal weapon when used against people who have the means and motivation to shoot back. A handgun's best feature is its relatively small size and weight when compared against its much more effective relatives, the shotgun and the rifle. In most routine law enforcement situations, it is not practical to carry a long gun. But anyone who has the opportunity to prepare for a shootout would be foolish to only rely on a handgun if a shotgun or rifle is available. To give you an idea of the power of a 12-gauge shotgun with nine double-O buck pellets, this man was shot by a mob hitman as he sat in his car. The hitman walked up as the victim opened his car door and he fired seven times. You can see the devastating nature of the wounds, which is especially evident when you note that the wounds in the back of the neck and behind the ear penetrated completely through the head, exiting out the front of his neck, and the shot behind the ear exited through his face. 
Now, it's impossible for us to include in this tape any specific recommendation as to the most effective bullets now available, because things change too much. And by the time you see this, whatever is good now may be changed by the manufacturer for the worse, or simply not be available. And there may be something completely new on the market, which is better than anything we know about now. What I hope to leave you with is not a particular brand name, but an understanding of the performance characteristics you should expect in a bullet. Let's review the important elements in the effective use of handguns against the human target. To achieve rapid incapacitation, first you must hit your target and most importantly put your bullets into a critical area. This requires first that you have a reliable and accurate handgun and second that you have a high degree of shooting skill which comes from good training and constant practice. Once you have a good handgun and you are able to shoot accurately, then you can hope to obtain a rapid incapacitation with a large permanent cavity or hole, which is a direct function of the diameter of your bullet, which should be as large as possible, keeping in mind that any bullet's diameter can effectively become even larger if you have an expanding bullet which reliably expands. And the permanent cavity, the hole you create, must be deep enough to penetrate the large vessels lying deep inside the body. A heavy bullet, solid or hollow point, will penetrate deeper than a lighter one. Remember, it is the large and deeply penetrating holes which will give you the best chance to stop someone quickly when you must. Your best chance for rapid incapacitation will result from multiple hits. Two quick hits are much better than one and three or more hits are even better. What all this boils down to is placement and penetration. These are the two concepts you should take with you. Where your bullet hits and how deeply it travels. Placement and penetration. Let those two words, those two concepts be your guide. Don't be fooled by any flawed government studies, temporary cavities, duct seal holes, neurological shock, and other such speculations. Get back to the basics. Remember, it's where you hit and what you destroy that counts. Nothing else. For those interested in a meaningful test, which will show bullet penetration and effectiveness, we have added this special section. Now, when Dr. Facker began his research on gunshot wounds, he realized that there was no valid medium in which to test bullets. For years, gun riders, law enforcement specialists, and even ammunition manufacturers have been using duck seal, an oil-based clay-like compound, in their testing, but no one had ever properly compared the results obtained in duck seal with those of living tissue. Dr. Facker quickly found that duct seal was not an effective tissue simulant. The other substance used by most scientifically oriented wound ballistics authorities was ballistic gelatin. This medium was favored by many as it is transparent and allows visual or photographic examination of the bullet track. But Dr. Facker quickly found that the ballistic gelatin did not accurately replicate the results he got with his tests in living tissue. After some experimentation, he found a proper mixture and preparation method and temperature, which produces a highly consistent result when tested against tissue. What this means is that if a bullet will penetrate 10 inches in a living tissue test, it will also do the same in his gelatin. If a hollow point expands in living muscle, it will also expand in his gelatin. Now before we go on, let's compare the gelatin with the duct seal. Now, to give an example of the different characteristics of the duct seal as opposed to the gelatin, we're going to fire this 9mm, 125 grain, soft point spear, spear, bullet. spear bullet into both the duct seal and the gelatin. And what do you think is going to happen? I know what's going to happen. What's that? <laughs> it's not going to change the, the bullet is not going to deform at all in the gelatin or in animal tissue because I've shot it in both and it will give you a, a, a marked mushrooming in the duct seal. Do you think there are a lot of bullets that will actually mushroom in duct seal or won't mushroom in, in, in tissue, in human tissue, or? Oh yes, well, a very common bullet, a 22 long rifle, round-nosed uh, round bullet. Yeah. Very, very common bullet. 
and in human body, animal body, or gelatin does not deform at all. And in duck seal gives you a magnificent mushroom, mm. as good as a hollow point pole. Well, we'll try it. Yes. Before we show you the penetration in duck seal, we have set up an experiment which will prove two points. First, that duck seal is not a good testing medium. And secondly, that Dr. Fackler's gelatin is indeed calibrated to tissue. The legs you see belong to the rear section of a pig which has just been killed. We're going to use the same bullet we fired into duck seal earlier. It will go through the pig tissue and then into the gelatin. So what have we what have we done here now with this pig meat and gelatin? Okay, basically what we have done, we have taken a bullet that we tested in pure gelatin before, and we had a penetration depth of 77 centimeters. Now we've added 14 and a half centimeters of pig which was the first thing the bullet hit. And we did this to show that the deformation of the bullet by the pig is the same as the deformation by the gelatin. And also to confirm the equivalence in, of gelatin and pig as far as penetration distance. So if we measured this, we got 14, 14, 14 and a half centimeters. We have 50 centimeters here. And, and here we have 11 centimeters of penetration into the second block. This adds up to 75 and a half centimeters in this combination, and with just gelatin, we had 77 centimeters. Before we shot two gelatin blocks, there was side yeah, by side. Yeah, two like gelatin blocks. And the, the bullet went through one of them completely and ended up right ended there. Ended up right over here. And the second time, with the pig meat in front, we fired through the flesh, no bone, went completely through this block, and ended up here, which is a difference from here to here. Which is equivalent to the pig. Which is equivalent to the width of the pig. Yes. So we've shown that the pig meat um, does simulate or <laughs> simulate the gelatin. The gelatin does simulate the pig meat quite effectively. What about the duck seal? Well, now we have quite a different story. In the duck seal, this was the same bullet at the same velocity. And as you can see, we in the gelatin, we had 77 centimeters. Here in the, we have a penetration depth of 11 centimeters and the bullet has deformed markedly. We see a, a mushrooming type deformation of this bullet into the duck seal, and there's no deformation of the bullet in the pig or the gelatin. This uh, shows quite clearly the severe uh, limitations, or shall I say misleading nature of determining effects of a bullet using duck seal as a tissue simulant. So we had in, in gelatin, may I use it for a second? Yes. We had um, a total penetration when we used the two gelatins like that, with that round, that nine millimeter round, of about 77 centimeters, which is about 30 and a half inches, 31 inches. And here we have about four or five inches. Yes. So four difference. or five inches in duck seal is about seven, about 31 inches in flesh. Yes. So duck seal a bullet was much more likely to expand in duct seal. Oh, absolutely. In human absolutely. Flesh or absolutely. Flesh or so a bullet manufacturer that uses duct seal to show you how well their bullets expand is extremely misleading. You might as well use a brick. That's true. Okay, one of the problems involved in using gelatin, I imagine, is making this stuff. This doesn't come in blocks like this, right? That's right. It does not come in blocks like this. And actually, there's a very large problem involved in making the gelatin. Unfortunately, the maker of the company, when you buy the gelatin in these box, it's a, a powder, su powdered substance that comes in 25-pound drums, and uh, you mix the powder, a certain weight amount of powder, with water, and unfortunately, they do not include any directions. 
no, no directions? No directions come with it, unfortunately. As of, as of yet, they don't. We've talked to the company, and maybe they'll change and put directions in. And what has resulted, uh, many people uh, who take up the wound ballistics uh, studies get the gelatin, and they make the assumption that you make it the same way you would jello at home, and that is start with boiling water. And doing that ruins the characteristics that you bought the gelatin for. It ruins the, it the, ruins the gelatin, yes. Gelatin is a protein. And as you well know, cooking a protein changes its structure and changes the gelatin. We uh, inadvertently heated the gelatin too high when we first started here and noticed it just did not have the same characteristics. It was very, very weak and, and sloppy characteristics. And, and therefore, we experimented around a little bit and found out that we had to keep it below 65 degrees centigrade and preferably even lower than that. And uh, then, then it comes out all right. Now, you can get directions from, uh, if you write to the company, they will give you directions. And uh, their first, their first uh, direction says, always start with cold water, 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And people who don't have these directions or don't know anything about it, start out with boiling water, ruin their gelatin. And there are a lot of studies uh, in the literature of people who use this gelatin. For instance, if you see anyone who's got a temporary cavity uh, for the M16 of about 25 centimeters, you know that they ruined their gelatin because the gelatin gets very sloppy. The high-speed camera will give you a much larger temporary cavity, but the cracks will be smaller because it's m much more flexible and doesn't, uh, it's, so it's it just totally ruined. If you make it correctly, it's beautifully reproducible and very, very useful. If you make it wrong, you can ruin it. And most people have made it wrong, and that's unfortunate. We, we hope that the company will put directions and put a put a uh, a limitation for instance in the directions which they send as they have at step five you heat in a container of hot water but they give no limitation mm -hmm. you know how high do you heat yeah. and that's that's so so really you know uh, and but when you call them on the telephone we talk to their research director and he said oh absolutely you'll ruin your gelatin if you heat it and i said well, there's nothing on this why don't you why don't you tell people that, <laughs> there's nothing on the drum that says that's that. right there's nothing and that's unfortunate so i think the company is really partially responsible for the uh the bad results we came upon it uh, just because uh my technician happened to notice it and then we we looked at it and we thought about it a bit and we experimented with it and we found yes as a matter of fact it changes a great deal if you heat it too high 